This is Billy Kay, welcoming you to a history of Scottish literature, programme two, Lament for the Makers. Hugh McDermott, in saying that modern poets should return to Dunbar rather than Burns, is accepting that this is the most ambitious lyricist ever in Scottish canon. You've got a very sophisticated court in which these poets are flourishing. William Dunbar, just slightly before that, Robert Henryson, Gavin Douglas as well. And you have that moment of regeneration and the assertion of identity in Douglas's translation of the Aeneid. Professors Alan Rioch of Glasgow and Ronnie Jack of Edinburgh University introducing a golden age of Scottish creativity when the Makers produced some of the greatest poetry of Europe in the later 15th and 16th centuries, a poetry which flourished in the glittering milieu of the court of the Stuart Kings, Theo van Heinsbergen and Jamie Reid Baxter. Court poetry must have always flourished in Scotland. We hear some court poetry in French, the 13th century, Le Roman de Frégus, about Fergus Lord of Galloway. The problem for a lot of earlier Scottish poetry is that the texts have simply disappeared. Remember, there were a lot of invasions. Oliver Cromwell removed it, every single written document he could find for Scotland. It was rather like the Chinese in Tibet. We're not so sure about the early court poetry. We didn't have muckle trace of it. So really, the court poetry that we have begins in the reign of James IV. Dunbar has a very aureate style, it has been called, a, a golden, a gilded style. And it was a critic, Lois Eben, who compared his style of writing and how he introduces words and particularly adjectives in his text as a process of enamelling, of making an artefact and then pushing it into the oven, make it hard and gilded and give it a shiny surface. And I find it such a useful way to describe exactly what it is that he does in his more aureate poetry. The crystal air the sapphire firmament, the ruby skies of the Orient, cast burial beams on emerald boas green. The rosy garth, de paint and redolent, with purpure azure, gold and gules gent. A ray it was by Dame Flora the Queen, so nobly that joy was for to see. He introduces words which are very kind of colourful. The golden candle matutine for the sun, the azure skies, the topaz flowers. You remember the richness of the tapestry of colours that he gives you and hues. And it is partly because of that quality, I think, this so-called enamelled or illuminate quality, that his poems can strike you in the same noteworthy way as an illuminated medieval manuscript can do. You just see it and you will remember it for a long time. Ante the death goes all his status, princes, prelates, and potestates, both rich and poor of all degree, Timor mortis come turbat me. The great Welsh actor Richard Burton, haunted by Dunbar's beautiful poem Lament for the Makers, which cites many of the missing poets we've no trace of today. Just that very human Latin refrain, the fear of death disturbs me. Modern Makers, Sheena Blackhall and Andrew Gregg. One of the lines I would always want to start a book with is, I that in heal and gladness was, I'm troubled it now by sad infirmity, Timor mortis contour about me. That gloomy thing which I would wish to be no part of, but is part of me. That strong and merciful tyrant, Takis and the mother's breast sukan, the babe full of benignity, Timur Mortis contour back me. It's like an incantation. And did you recognise the affinity with that poetry and that language we what was surrounding you as a bear and tea? Yes, that was just part of your tradition. But the fact that it was written down and valued in a book gave it a great heist. He has ten rule o Eberdeen and gentil rule o Corstorfin. To our better followers that did no man see, Timor Mortis conturbat me. He cites fellow makers, fellow poets, 
as examples of a greater tragedy, if you like. It's not just human beings who are dying. It's people who've transcended their humanity by leaving great literature. And that is a tremendous statement of solidarity in the mm -hmm. early days of Scottish literature in a lot yes. of ways. Yes, it is quite striking. But Dunbar's poem stands out in this sense of listing individuals who have gone before, poets of Europe, then English poets, and finally with Scottish poets, and then putting himself at the very end of that tradition. Then he has all my brother tain, he will not let me live alone. Of force I man his necks pray be. Timor mortis come turbat me. But Dunbar was also a poet of the here and now, with satirical send-ups of the Renaissance court and characters ranging from fellow artists to pretentious messieurs of France, get claret connors. He lists equally as many people whom he has little time for. The flatterers, the fleechers, the feigners, the whole hunters of duck, you know, the people who come and hunt ducks, but only the ones that we shall already lay down on a banquet table. He also... In contrast to his aureate, latinate, enamelate style, he can be Guy Coors as well. <laughs> Guy Coors, <laughs> aye. Even somebody like Tom Scott, a left-wing critic of the 1960s, said Dunbar is a fascinating poet, but I will not deal with this one particular poem because it is explicit and he thought it an obscene rant which he thought was unworthy of Dunbar. There are three ladies sitting, you initially think, in a courtly garden but actually they're pissed out their minds, and so you get drunken truth. To see him scat his own skin, great scunner, I think. When kisses me that carry bald, then kindles all my sorrow. As burst of a brim bear, his beard is a stiff, but soft and supple as the silk is his serry loom. He hears in this beautiful garden three beautiful ladies. He describes how gorgeously they're attired and how beautiful they are with flowing golden hair and what they say about their husbands. I, when that caribald carl would climb in my way, then I'm a dangerous and dane and dure my will. Yet let a never that lad where my legs go between to file my flesh and fumble me without a fee grit. In a way, he's doing the Orient style, but upside down. And this is what really drew me to Scottish writing when I started reading it, that Scottish writing has the same building blocks as English, or indeed French, yet they push it towards literary, linguistic, cultural extremes. We know from the collection of Margaret Robertson of Lude that Baudry was not confined to the royal court, and that women were creative in the genre as well. At the seat of Clan Campbell in the Gaeltach, for example, Isabella, Countess of Argyll, composed a remarkable praise poem. Elizabeth Ewan of Guelph University and the poet Anuz Machnechkel. The interesting one particularly is Eistjevaluk and Tehisho. Listen, people of this house, an innocuous title for a poem that is described as a fairly obscene boast to the court circle on the size and potency of her household priest's penis. Would you like to read it rather than me? <laughs> you would like you to read it. <laughs> of course, she could get away with it because she's a very high-status woman as well. But I would like to have actually been in the, the hall when she declaimed this or to be her household chaplain when he heard it. That could be also very interesting. <laughs> Never read this aloud before. <laughs> Listen, people of this house, to the tale of the powerful penis, which has made my heart greedy. I will write some of the tale. The penis of my household priest, though it is so long and firm, the thickness of his manhood has not been heard of for a long time. That thick drill of his, and it is no word of a lie, never has its thickness been heard of or a larger penis. That must have caused quite a furore in its time, you would think. It causes a furore in me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, like, I like to read this poem to my students to give them a sense of the fun that people had in the Middle Ages as well. Behold my heat, behold my gay attire, behold my house, loosome and lily white, behold my visage, flamand as the fire, behold my paps of portraiture perfite. To look on me, lovers, has great delight. Richtsee has all the kings of Christendom. 
To them I have done pleasurous infinite. Gerda Stevenson relishing the words of sensuality in the work of Sir David Lindsay from the court of James V. More of him to come. But first, an awareness of the importance of this period to Scottish culture, with Derek McClure of Aberdeen University, reading from the 18th century poet Alan Ramsay, who recalls the learned days of Gawain Dunkeld, Gavin Douglas, Bishop of Dunkeld. This provokes me to reflect on the lear days of Gawain Dunkeld, who country then a tale could tell. Europe had nane mere swack and snell in verse and prose, or kings were poets to themselves, bald and jocose. So we were once a great nation, even our kings were fine poets. So come on, he writes to his friend William Hamilton, let's get going, let's just re-establish, let's make Scotland a great poetic nation again. In November 2013, Douglas was commemorated in Edinburgh's Mackers Court, the family represented by his grace, the Duke of Hamilton. The Aneodos completed 500 years ago this year, is seen as one of Scotland's finest contributions to European civilization. Gavin Douglas, provost of the High Kirk of St Giles and later Bishop of Dunkeld, can surely be considered one of the great Scots mackers. I am very proud indeed to be able to unveil this stone, celebrating his achievement. One of the reasons for celebrating Gavin Douglas is the fact that it is the 500th anniversary of the completion of the Aeneidos. And perhaps the greatest of the achievements of James's reign are a mass by Robert Carver and the Aeneidos. This is where Scotland really seeks the heights. And in the piece commemorating the Battle of Flodden that's going to be sung after the mass in Gavin Douglas's own High Kirk of St Giles tonight, there is a line in the Latin poem written the year before Flodden, Parca verbis sed alta cupid, speaking about the Scottish people, few their worms, yet they seek the heights. Gavin Douglas took the Scots language to the heights and used it to express the most difficult concepts in a way that ordinary Scots would have access to the glory of Roman culture by translating into Scots for his own people, written in language of Scottish nation. The unveiling was modern marker Ron Butlin. I'm here because I must say I really love Gavin Douglas. It was McDermott that I really first read in Scots and then I began working my way backwards as it were and it then came to Douglas and I was absolutely blown when I saw it. I just thought mind-blowing stuff. Once I discovered Douglas, I just thought, oh yeah, this is it. This is the way I talked as a kid. You have to remember that was at a time when I remember getting scalped of the lug at school and told not to speak gutter talk. So when I do read Gavin Douglas, I read it aloud, and that really brings it so alive. It just leaps off the page. And then I was reading Ezra Pound's book. I was so delighted to see this. He said, Gavin Douglas' Aeneid is better than Virgil's, <laughs> which is a sort of, of course, telemic that Pound would come out with. But I just thought, yes, I just think it's such a fantastic poem, possibly the greatest poem we have in big terms, big epic terms in Scotland. It's just so wonderful. Douglas was the first to use the national term Scots to describe the mother tongue, and he consciously took every section of society with him. High art would no longer be the sole preserve of the clerkes, the Latin-speaking clerical elites. Gay, vulgar Virgil, till every churlish wicht, say I avow, thou art translated recht. No, so thou, 
we every gentle Scot be kenned, until unletterate folk be read on hecht, that erst was but we clerkes comprehend. The literature never quite gets away from ordinary people, which I think is a very important thing. Sir, if you please for to use my counsel, your fame and name shall be perpetual. There's always been that voice. And the great thing is that if anybody consults Scottish literature, they can hear the voice. They can hear however fragmentarily it's there. And there's a lot of literature where for long phases it isn't there. It's both a cultural thing and an implicitly political thing mm -hmm. that that voice should be heard. I mean, in, in Saturday, The Three Estates, is an astonishing play for its time that you should have that virile awareness of the underside of society as well as the court and the king and all that. At the time of performing in this production, I was researching and writing a play about homelessness. And it was wonderful to be doing Lindsay's play while I was working on that project because it is still so burningly radical. It's a revolutionary play and could not be more contemporary and more relevant now than it was 500 years ago. He was born in Fife with his own estate. Sir David Lindsay of the Mount is his full name. He then becomes the herald at the Scottish court, going around the country to pass on the king's messages, reading them out aloud, orchestrating the choreography of state events. And he becomes a chief herald, the so-called Lord Lion, because of the vestment that he would wear. That makes him very well-placed to speak on behalf of the king to the community, but also to listen to that community and channel back any responses of that community, because he was, of course, in the middle of both of these entities. And I think that position of trust within the royal apparatus of state allows him to write texts such as a satire of three estates and to be fiercely critical of the Catholic establishment, yet without breaking the mould of the society that his monarch is presiding over. The principal point, sir, of Ian King's office is for to do to Everilk man justice and for to mix his justice with mercy. But rigour, favour or partiality, forsooth, it is nae little observance great regions to have in governance. Whoever tax on him that kingly cure, to get in of the twa, he should be sure. Great pain and labour and that continual, or else to have defame perpetual. Wha guides weal, they win immortal fame. Wha the contraire, they get perpetual shame. David Lindsay was read and appreciated because of his upholding of the rights of the common man. In his play, The Satire of the Three Estates, you've got a character called John the Common Wheel, who represents the downtrodden common man who's oppressed and robbed by both the church and the state. So this has been a theme that's run through Scottish literature almost right from the beginning. Derek McClure with novelist James Robertson. And this sense of belonging has created a bond between writer and public which survives to the present day. William McIlvanny. It really gets the photo. I'm into the horseshoe bar in order to drink it. Just raised it to my mouth and the big guy to my left said, it was Glasgow on a Friday night, the city of the stair. And I said, wait a minute, it took me about two minutes. I wrote that again. <laughs> And we had a great conversation, and I love that, that there are people just knocking about who understand what you're doing. And I've had a lot of good, what I would call, street reviews from folk just passing, saying, hey, that was all right. You'd never get a city right, but I suppose I couldn't have got it completely wrong if some of the denizens of the place accept it. Mary, Queen of Scots, also had a great marker in Alexander Scott, but the final great flourishing of literature at the Scottish court came in the reign of James VI, whose tutor was the influential Latin writer George Buchanan, Professor Willie Maley of Glasgow University. Buchanan was a huge writer, massively important, a European intellectual, and certain connections between Buchanan and Edmund Spencer, Philip Sidney and later John Milton have been brought out in obscure corners of scholarship, but has not necessarily been known in the mainstream. And if you go to Calern and look at that fantastic obelisk erected to Buchanan in, in 1782 on the bicentenary of his death, you realise what an important figure he has. 
James VI was renowned all over Europe as a man of great learning and great scholarship. George Buchanan was his tutor, whereas David Lindsay, as James V's tutor, was nice and kind. Buchanan was anything but. Buchanan was very harsh. He didn't care if the young king liked him or not. He reduced him to tears. It's said that one of the court ladies protested at how harshly Buchanan was treating the young king, and Buchanan replied, I have puppet his erst, you can kiss it if you like. Wow. <laughs> and James VI said later on that Buchanan, he got me speak Latin, ere I could real speak Scots. James wrote a manual of poetic composition, rules and cottles to be observed and to it, things to do and things not to do when you're writing Scots poetry. And he was only in his early teens when he wrote this. The greatest glory of his court was his friend, Alexander Montgomery, that James himself cried, the master poet. One of the most spectacular features for me about Montgomery is the jewelledness of the poetry. He uses complex poetical forms, some of them that he's almost invented himself. That's the Helicon stanza. Which Burns it, uses later on. And Burns will use it. It's a stanza that has a long history. You've got 114 of these complex stanzas with that lovely kind of tale on the end. Adieu new, be true new, sin that we must depart. Forget nocht and set nocht licht, my constant hair. This really is a master poet. Nae treasures nor pleasures could mak us happy lang, the herp eyes the peart eye that marks us richt or rang. Aye. Burns is the only other in that can do it at the same level. He wrote sonnets, he wrote translations from French sonnets and Italian sonnets as well as sonnets of his own. And his main poem, the one that he's best remembered for, is a long allegorical poem called The Cherry and the Sleigh. Montgomery's Cherry and Sleigh remained enormously popular for centuries in Scotland. It was one of the great bestsellers of Scottish literature. It's first printed in 1597 in a shortened version. The full version appears in the beginning of the 17th century and goes through I don't know who money editions right down into the beginning of the 19th century. And one of the reasons it was as popular was this incredible treasure house of proverbs that it contains. The lawyers would constantly quote the cherry and the sleigh in order to make a point in the high court because everybody kent this poem and they kent these proverbs, but these were the proverbs beautifully formulated. A lesson worth to lear, whilk is in time for tetak tent and know when time is past repent and by repentance dear. In his novel Fair Helen, set at the time of the Union of the Crowns in 1603, Andrew Gregg depicts writers such as Drummond of Hawthorne Den and Alexander Montgomery in a brilliant court circle which the king called his sacred brethren of Castilian band. I just loved the phrase the Castilian band and I'd read this other person, William Fowler, I think his name was. Now he's worth a novel. Spy, courtier, poet, secretary to the queen. And he was part of this Castilian band that was grouped around the king. Another poet called Alexander Hume of Pobart had a flighting, an insult competition. They took it in turns to write poems insulting each other. Pobart, you peep like a moose among thorns. Nay cunning, you keep. Pobart, you peep. You look like a sheep when you had twa horns. Pobart, you peep like a moose among thorns. <laughs> That is exactly what Montgomery achieved, and also Dunbar and Kennedy. They gave as good as they get. But there is also an underlying, I think, appreciation of each other's art. In the same way that nowadays you get rappers fighting for dominance as poets, but at the same time, by the very fact of doing that in a joint piece of work, reflects a certain level of respect. And James judged that Montgomery got the best of this, and Montgomery got the place of honour, the place in the chimney nuke, the place closest to the fire when they were sitting for a, an evening of literary conversation. With the court moving south, royal patronage of Scots poetry ceased and the prestige of English language and literature increased. A poem by Zachary Boyd reflects the new duality. 
our words like clothes, such is vain man's condition. In length of time does all wear out of fashion. We are like echo, which by voice begot from hollow veils speaks words it knoweth not. But we'll draw this golden age to conclusion with an old Scots sonnet which was influenced by Pierre de Ronsard, who graced the court himself in the reign of James V. This is Alan Riach in Alloway. I think my most favourite poem from that poet era is a sonnet by Mark Alexander Boyd called Cupid and Venus. And Shakespeare's sonnets, of course, and Spencer's sonnets are looked on as the apogee of the sonnet writing form. But of course, there are great sonnet writers in modern Scottish literature, Edwin Morgan among them. But Ezra Pound, the great American poet, said, this is it, this is the greatest sonnet ever written. He said, if you look at the history of literature, poetry, the language ripens to a certain point in any era, and then it starts to decay. He says that this poem is the one sonnet at its most ripe. It's perfect, which means it's just got that edge on Shakespeare, you know. <laughs> the author is actually a local Ayrshire man, an area of Ayrshire down near Girvan. And I say to people, there's more to Scottish literature than Burns. I like to think of Mark Alexander Boyd in the background smiling. And I like to think also when Tam O'Shanter is riding from Ayr to Old Alloway, to the old haunted Kirk, and Burns describes him in his semi-drunken, not quite certain state, crooning old... Oh, sorry. Crooning our some old Scottish sonnet. Crooning our some old Scottish sonnet. And I like to think that maybe this is the sonnet he's crooning our. Oh, brilliant. Cupid and Venus. Frae bank to bank, frae wood to wood I rin, or hail it with my feeble fantasy. Like till a leaf that falls from a tree, or till a reed are blown with the wind. Twa gods guides me, the inner of them is blind, ay, and a bairn brocht up in vanity. The next a wife engendered of the sea, and lechter nor a dauphin with her fin. Unhappy is the man for ever mere, that tills the sand and saws in the air. But twice unhappier's he, I learn, that feeds in his heart a mad desire and follows on a woman through the fire, led by a blind and teach it by a bairn. There's so much that's there, it's like there's a line of Hugh McDermott where he says, very rarely does a man love, and when he does, it is nearly always fatal. 